Happy Sabbath to you. Please listen carefully to this week's announcements. Here are some important notes. Our fellowship groups or small groups begin this upcoming week. Be on the lookout for specific details about the date and time. If you have not registered for a group yet, it's not too late. You can register to join men, women, youth, or Bible study. To register, visit bit.ly forward slash BSDAC group. Registration is fast and easy, so don't wait. If you have an important note that you'd like to have announced to the church, please send an email to communication at burlingtonsda.org. All announcements should be emailed by Thursday evenings. Here are our upcoming events. Family Life Ministries presents Christian Home and Marriage Week, coming up on February 12th through the 19th. Our speakers are Pastor Ivor Kaiser, Pastor Joseph Small, and Heather Dawn Small. We will have more info to share with you soon about this special program. We want to offer a very happy birthday to Ada and Lena, who celebrate their birthdays this week. Happy birthday to you. If your name is missing from this list, please let us know. We want to celebrate with you. Join us for our standing events. Sabbath School is on Sabbaths at 9.15 a.m. Bible Study is on Sabbaths at 3 p.m. Women Prayer and Fast is on Wednesdays at 12 p.m. And Prayer Service is on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. You can return your tithe and offerings three ways. Via online at bit.ly forward slash BSDAC give via the Adventist Giving online mobile app, or via mail to 256 Conover Street in Burlington, New Jersey. If you need us for anything, here's how you can connect with us. Via phone call or text message, via email at info at burlingtonsda.org, or via social media, by Instagram or Facebook at Burlington SDA. If you've been tuning in each week on YouTube and have not yet subscribed, please hit that subscribe button. We want to make sure that you're not missing out on anything good. Be sure to give this worship service a thumbs up and share it with a friend or family member. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your Sabbath. Good morning, happy Sabbath. It is indeed a pleasure to be with you this morning. Those of you who are worshiping with us uh, from your homes and different platforms, we're happy to have you with us. As you know, uh, because of COVID, the church is closed at this time. Um, there's a future opening, I believe it's gonna be sometime in February, we'll let you know as soon as it reopens, as soon as we have that information. <clears throat> let us pray. Eternal Heavenly Father, we give you the honor and the glory and the praises this morning. We are so thankful for the breath of life that you woke us up this morning. There were so many, Lord, that didn't wake up. They slept through the night and continue to sleep until you come. So Father, we, we're just so thankful and so merciful that you've seen it within your grace to allow us to walk this earth one more time. Father, we pray for those who are online today the families that are present, those who are sick. We ask, Lord, that you go by and just touch them. Let them feel your presence. Let them know that you're there. We ask in Christ Jesus' name this morning. Amen. Hello, everyone. It's Aunt Fernita, and we're studying Lesson 4, A Picture of God. The message is God's commandments help us understand Him. The memory verse for this week is from Psalm 119, verse 165. Great peace have they who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. Mika jumped up and down with excitement as she looked at the letter from her grandma. In the letter was a picture of grandma in her new garden. 
It helped Mika see exactly how Grandma looked now, and it reminded her of the fun things that they had done. Letters, photos, phone calls, and video chats help you remember what that person is like. In today's lesson, God gave the Israelites some words that helped them know what He is like. This was the day. God had told the Israelites to get ready. He was coming to Mount Sinai to talk with them. For two days they had been getting ready, washing their clothes, and above all, staying away from the mountain. God had forbidden them to touch it. Thunder and lightning and a thick, dark cloud hung over the mountain. Suddenly, a loud trumpet blasted. The people trembled. Moses led the people to the foot of the mountain. Smoke covered the mountain and the earth shook. The sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then God spoke. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. First, God reminded the Israelites who he was. He loved them. He wanted them to know and love him too. He knew what they needed to be happy. So he came to Mount Sinai to give them the Ten Commandments. God spoke, You shall have no other gods before me. God wanted them to respect his power to make him the most important thing in their lives. Then God said, You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For a long time the Israelites had been in Egypt, where people worshipped many idols. They had forgotten how to worship God. God spoke again, You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who misuses his name. When we love someone, we are careful to respect their name. For the fourth commandment, God said, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. God gave us the Sabbath as a special time to rest and to get to know Him better. He also wants us to remember the wonderful way He created us and cares for us. When God gave the fifth commandment, He said, Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. God gave us parents to love us, to care for us, and to help us learn right from wrong. In return, God wants us to respect them and to obey them. God knew that living in loving families is best for us. The next four commandments were short, telling the Israelites how they were to act toward other people. You shall not murder. God alone can give life, and He wants us to respect and protect it. You shall not commit adultery. God wants happy families. He wants parents to be married to each other and to love each other in a special way they don't share with anyone else. You shall not steal. God wants us to respect the things that belong to others. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. God's words are true, and He wants our words to be true as well. The last commandment told the Israelites how they should feel when other people have nice things that they don't have. You should not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. God wants us to focus on Him, not on other people or what they have. God gave these commandments to the Israelites to help them understand Him and what is important to Him. And God knew the Israelites would be happier if they followed His rules. God's rules still tell us what is important to Him. The Ten Commandments still help us understand what God is like. They still give us a picture of God who loves us and wants the best for us.
Happy Sabbath, church. It's now time for praise and worship. It's time to praise our Lord in our King. I'll praise you and sing to you, to your name. Romans 15, verse 9. Our first song is, It is to you I give the glory. It is to you I give the glory. It is to you I give the praise. Lord, you have done so much for me, and I will bless your holy name. It is to you, Holy Father, no one like you, and I will bless your name. Bless your name. Bless your name forevermore. It is to you I give the glory. It is to you I give the praise. Lord, you have done so much for me, and I will bless your holy name. It is to you, Holy Father, no one like you, and I will bless your name, bless your name, bless your name forevermore. It is to you I give the glory, it is to you I give the praise, Lord, you have done so much for me, and I will bless your holy name. It is to you, Holy Father, no one like you, and I will bless your name. Bless your name. Bless your name blessed your name and i will bless your name bless your name bless your name bless your name and i will bless your name forevermore Amen. We'll bless his name. Amen. Our next song is What a Mighty God We Serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. I said, what a mighty, what a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Jesus is the God we serve. Jesus is the God we serve. Angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him. Jesus is the God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. I said, what a mighty, what a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. I say, what a mighty, what a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we say. I say, what a mighty, what a mighty God we say. I just bow before him, heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we say. 
Jesus is the God we serve. Jesus is the God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. Jesus is the God we serve. Amen. Our opening song is number six, Oh Worship the Lord. Oh, worship the Lord and the beauty of holiness. Bow down before him, his glory proclaim. With gold of obedience and incense of lowliness. Kneel and adore him, the Lord is his name. Low at his feet. Lay that burden of carefulness high on his heart, he will bear it for thee. Comfort thy sorrows and answer thy prayerfulness. Guarding thy spirit is made best before thee. Fear not to enter his courts and the slenderness. Of the poor of the rust, where can I dine? Truth and his beauty, and love and his tenderness. These are the offerings to lay on his shrine. These do we bring them in trembling and fearfulness. He will accept for the name that is dear. Morning of joy, give for evening of tearfulness. Trust for a trembling and hope for a fear. Amen. We thank you, Sister Daphne, for that, the beautiful songs. Our um, opening song is page 487, In the Garden. <clears throat> I come to the garden alone, while the dew is still on the road. And the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, 
none other has ever I'd stay in the garden with him through the night around me be falling. But he bids me go through the voice of woe, his voice to me is calling and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Amen. Amen. It's now time for family prayer. So I'm going to ask you to. Take the hands of everyone that's around you. Husbands, put your arms around your wives. Wives, hold on to your husbands as we bow our heads in prayer. Eternal Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful this morning that we are allowed, permitted to come into your grace in your presence. First, we ask, Lord, that you forgive us for our sins, those we know of and those we don't know of. Thank you for your protection of the, the unholy one is trying his best to take us and snatch us out of your hand. Father, this world is in trouble. The nations around us are in trouble. Russia is threatening war against another country and this country is, is threatening not to let it happen. Father, we know that everything is in your control and in your hands and things happen according to your will and your pleasure. So we ask, Father, that you just love us a little more and a little deeper. Send your Holy Spirit, Father. There's a, there's a spirit, a Holy Spirit in this place this morning. We can feel it. We can feel his presence. We thank you, Lord, for um, our loved ones, those who have overcome the viruses. There are many more that are suffering in my family as well as other families over this coronavirus. Even though we've had the vaccinations and the, the um, other shots that is required, people are still getting sick. Just the other day, a husband and, and his son had a coronavirus and they had their shots. And the wife, I understand, was a singer that she traveled around the world singing in different places and concerts. and. She figured that if she just got close to her, her husband and children, if she got the virus and got the shots, that she would be safe. She caught the virus from her family and she died. Father, we, we, we know that there, you have made provisions and ways for safety for us. But people today, they just don't trust you. They haven't trust. They don't trust the government. They don't trust anybody. And so we ask, Lord, that you put your loving arms around them anyway. Keep them safe. Protect our children. Children are being born in this world today that won't live to be a year or two or five years old. They were dying. They're being snatched from their parents. Children are being stolen and taken off the streets. We haven't seen for a while. But Father, we know that you said these things were happening. They're going to happen in all parts of the world. We're having all kinds of tornadoes and earthquakes and even underwater volcano had erupted and and springs of, of ash come up from, from the oceans, Lord. And, and people was wondering why, how can there be volcanoes in the ocean? But they forget, Lord, that you at one time had flooded this world. And there are still mountains and, 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 and things that are so deep under the earth that we will never know about until you bring them to the surface. So Father, we ask you, Lord, to just protect us, protect our brothers and sisters here in the church, those who are at home, uh, gathering together with friends and neighbors. 
Let us remember, Lord, the Sabbath day to keep it holy, to keep your commandments holy. There was a time that we, we recited the commandments every Sabbath, and we've gotten away from it. So, Father, we ask, Lord, that you to bring us back to teach us and to honor you. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's offering time. Life is so complicated that we sometimes fear not being able to find the right direction. Martin, a pastor visiting a foreign country, had to go to the airport before sunrise, so he hired a taxi. Now, the driver was not using any GPS system to guide him, but he seemed quite confident about the direction to the airport. And then he started driving around in the city looking for the right exit. The pastor, looking at his watch, realized that check-in was now open. Finally, the driver explained on the highway that he'd never been to the airport, but a friend had once given him the directions. He was regularly craning his neck to look for road signs. The driver was hesitant, and this made the pastor nervous and worried. After driving for 30 minutes, the supposed duration of the trip, he stopped the car on a narrow stretch in the middle of nowhere. The confused driver made several phone calls, and time was running out. Check-in was now closed, and the pastor was stuck with a driver who still did not know the direction to the airport. That doesn't have to be so for our life's journey. Humanity was created with a manual to journey through the maze of life. In the beginning, the Lord provided clear instructions to our first parents. He said, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. By just following God's guidance, they would have been free from worry. Through His Word and the Holy Spirit, the Divine Provider instructs us about managing our relationships and our God-given resources. Even though He can straighten what we've ruined, our life's journey may become smoother if we look for His directions before starting it. Those who follow His instructions are on track to reach their goals and the final destination. As you worship God with your tithe and promise, invite Him to lead you in your life decisions and the management of your resources. May we put our desires last and God first. We thank you for your faithfulness and your tithes and your offerings. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 4, verses 21 through 24. And it reads as such. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming. When you will will neither on this or in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship in what you do not know, and we worship what we worship for salvation of the Lord, of the Jews. For the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is, is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. May the Lord give a blessing to the reading of his word this morning. I know my problem is when the, my phone rings, everything goes out. Let's hold on a minute. Right, we now have a selection from Pastor Lawrence uh, Elder. I mean, Lawrence uh, Landon. Oh, can I see past 
that you have done for me. Things so undeserved that you give to prove your love for me. The voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude. All that I am ever hope to be I will to be to God be the glory to God be the glory Pastor London, to God be the glory for the things he has done. He has done many things for us, hasn't he? Our speaker uh, today, I believe he's from the Oranges, from the church in the Oranges. He's an elder. He's been here before. He's no um, stranger to the pulpit. So I'm going to introduce him at this time. I'm going to, uh, his first name is Elder John. I'm not going to pronounce his last name because last time I messed it up. So he'll give you his last name when he comes. So we'll bring to you right now, Elder John. Hello, good morning. Can everybody hear me? 
Yes. yes Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath. It's good to see you again. Uh, always good to be with Burlington Church. You know, I feel like uh, it's one of my churches as well. Uh, so again, my name is John. Uh, I teach uh, at Lake Nelson Adventist Academy. And, uh, you know, uh, teaching is one of my favorite things to do. So basically what you're going to have today, again, is not, as you know, I, I don't really preach, I teach. So uh, we saw the story, we saw the story in, um, in uh, John chapter four, where the Samaritan woman is, uh, is, she meets Jesus. And so, you know, that's a familiar story, but to know, sometimes it's important for you to delve and ask yourself, how did we get to this point? So this is the part where we're actually going to delve into that. And um, when Pastor Banner asked me to preach today, uh, it was in the context of uh, religious liberty. So I was looking into this story, the the, the depth of that story, and it, it, it has a lot of overtones and undertones of religious liberty. So uh, please bear with me. And I'm just going to tell you right off the bat that uh, we're not going to be able to finish this story today. So we might we might have to do uh, a couple more of the sermons, a, a couple more of the sessions so that we, we could actually uh, get this, uh, this going. So let's pray and let's delve into the story. Father God, thank you so much <clears throat> for your blessings. Thank you for uh, everything that you have done, Lord. And, and as the song said, to you be the glory for all the things that you have done. Uh, there is nothing that we can say that we have done on our own because uh, of our own, Lord, uh, our righteousness is like filthy rags. So we pray that you will bless us, that you will forgive us, that you will guide us today, and that you would open our hearts to receive your truth. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. So let me go to that story in John chapter four, uh, which is one of my favorite stories. Uh, John chapter four starts like this. It says, therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, and John puts a uh, John, John the, the gospel writer, puts a note there. He says, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. So if you're looking at a map of, uh, of, of Israel, uh, when, when, when you look at a map of Israel, uh, at that time, leaving Judea, which is in the south, uh, to go to Galilee, you're going along the Jordan and uh, and, and then, you know, on, if you're if you're on the on the west side of the Jordan, on the west side of the Jordan, uh, because the Jordan runs uh, north south. So if you're in the west side of the Jordan, uh, you could think uh, of it. If you're in the United States, you're in the west side of the Mississippi River. Uh, on that side is also the land which is called Samaria. So uh, most Jews that respected themselves whenever they were traveling north to go from Judea to Galilee, which is in the north, they would not go through Samaria. They would go around. They would cross the Jordan, go to the east side of the Jordan, go north until they go past the land that is Samaria and then cross again uh, to the west bank and move, uh, uh, keep moving in, in, in that area. So uh, if you've ever heard of conflicts on of the West Bank of the Jordan, et cetera, the, these, these are the same lands that, that, that they existed, uh, same conflicts that ex existed uh, probably deeper right now. But it says he departed again to Galilee. He left Judea and departed again to Galilee. Verse four says, but he needed to go through Samaria. So Jesus, instead of going around, instead of crossing the Jordan to go from the, the west side to go to the east side and then go north and then cross again from the west into the from the east into the west, he says, I'm going to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now, Joseph's well was there. Hmm. 
Jacob's well was there. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Sixth hour meaning noon time. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Said, uh, Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And, you know, whenever Jesus is doing something, you know, you always have to be, uh, you have to, to watch what Jesus does. because. That he does. He never does anything um, without a purpose. So they're traveling in a group. He always travels with these people. They're traveling in a group. But then he tells them, "Hey guys, go get some food." Uh, and they go get some food because they're thinking, "Yeah, you know." Uh, and and I wonder, no, I wonder if anybody said, "You know, you're going to stay here by yourself." Uh, but I'm sure they're used to, to it by now. They're probably thinking, okay, no problem. It's one of those uh, other moments where Jesus says, okay, go get some food. So they go get food. But he had a plan. He had an appointment with this woman of Samaria in this city of Samaria, and he did not want it to be interrupted. So verse uh, eight says, then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you being a Jew Ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman. Hmm. Now, I don't know if I've said this to you before, if you've heard it before. This, this conversation is best understood in the context of sass. So this woman is sassing Jesus. And Jesus is actually uh, kind of being sarcastic with her. Because he goes like, uh, give me a drink. But the disciples had gone away. So give me a drink. So now this woman is thinking, what kind of, why is this man asking me for a drink at noon? So she responds the same way that anyone will, will respond to a strange request from a strange man, from a, uh, from, from a tribe of people that you don't agree with, that you have trouble with. Because the very next thing, that John puts in the gospel says, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Hmm. Keep that in mind because this is going to be the, the key of the history that we're going to go into to ask, uh, to ask ourselves, how did we get here? How did we get to this point? Because Jesus appears in this city of Sikar, uh, and he had a specific divine appointment with this woman. But we don't see the context and we don't see the background. So that's why you need to go back into the stories of the, of, of the Bible. And there's one particular story that ties it all together that we're going to look at today. So we start at the, the, the well with Jesus and this woman, but we're going to go wor uh, work our way backwards in the past to understand how is it that they get to a point where Samaritans and Jews have no dealings with each other. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you that living water. So they go back and forth. They go back and forth. He tells her, OK, you know, uh, uh, you know, if I give you this water, you would never get thirst again. And she goes, like, oh, well, if that's the kind of water you're going to give me, well, produce it then. And then at first she goes like, how are you going to give me water when you have some, nothing to draw? You know, so it's like she she's again begin, being a little bit sassy, a little bit sarcastic. It's like, how are you going to give me water? if You got nothing to draw, you know, you and then and then uh, and then she's like, wait a minute. Where are you going to get this water from in the first place? Are you greater than Jacob who dug this well for us? And then, you know, uh, and, and made it so that from generation upon generation, we've been able to 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 drink of this water. He tells her to go find her husband. She says, I don't have a husband. He says, well, you're right, because you have had five. And the one that you're with right now is not your husband. Uh, and then she goes to the city. She says, come meet a man who has told me everything about myself. The conclusion that I want to get to is uh, found in verses 21 through 24. Through 26. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. 
you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. In spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Hmm. Before that, the reason why Jesus responded to her is because she has said, well, we worship on this mountain. We've been doing this since the days of Jacob. But you Jews say that we have to go worship in Jerusalem. So which is it? Which one is it? And, and, uh, and he says, oh, well, don't worry about it. It's neither this nor that. Because sometimes as Christians, we get bogged down into the form of worship, into the method of worship, into the place of worship, that we forget that God is not limited to the form, to the place, and to the method. God says, God is truth, and God is spirit. And so therefore, God is going to accept worship in the form that is spiritual and truth-based. Spiritual and truthful, in spirit and in truth. So we ask ourselves, how did we get here? Well, just as any conflict, this one didn't start just between this woman and Jesus. And it didn't even start a generation before that. This conflict starts all the way back in 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. So if you go to 1 Kings chapter 11, uh, you find Solomon. And Solomon has, uh, you should read a little bit more about Solomon. I don't have time to get into that because uh, Solomon has uh, married in first Kings chapter three, we see that he has married an Egyptian woman. And, uh, and then later in second Chronicles, uh, we find that not only did he marry this Egyptian woman, but he didn't, he failed, he failed to introduce her to Christ. And because he did not introduce her to Christ, now he cannot bring her into David's palace. And because he can't bring her into David's palace, but he still wants to be married with her and he hasn't introduced her to Christ. And he cannot bring her into David's palace because David's palace had had the Ark of the Covenant stay there. So there's a there's a note, I think, in Second Chronicles chapter eight that tells you uh, everywhere where the Ark has been is holy. So he could not bring his wife into this place. So we know that Solomon built the temple. He spent seven years building the temple. But he spent 13 years building the new palace where he could actually have his Egyptian wife. So that began a downward or a downhill uh, slope for, for Solomon. And we see that this has now come to a, 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 a head where it has come to a, 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 you know, a, a, a climax in 1 Kings chapter 11. It says, but King Solomon loved many foreign women as well as the daughter of Pharaoh. Remember, he had married daughter of Pharaoh. That was his first wife. But uh, he chose, okay, you know, I'm not going to convert her, etc. But on top of that, he had other women that he married. Um, he's, it says, uh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. From the nations of whom the Lord has said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn your hearts away after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. 
this was very interesting because um, Solomon's name, uh, Shlomo, comes from the word Shalom, uh, which means peace. He also had another name, Jedidiah, meaning beloved of Yahweh. When Solomon was born, God promised David that this son of yours is going to be king after you, and he is not going to see war. In other words, Solomon was going to be a king of peace, just like his name says. Uh, he was supposed to be a type of Christ, uh, meaning uh, like, a, like a model of Christ, prince of peace. This one uh, was, going to, when it was going to have a, a, a kingdom that has no war. But Solomon continually thought like a human being rather than thinking with the wisdom that God had given him. So he saw all of these nations around him and thought maybe they might come to attack. And if they come to attack, he's going to be in trouble. So he would make treaties with them. And in those days, the way they made treaties, the king would marry the princess from uh, another land or the son of the king would marry a princess from another land or the daughter. You know, they would intermarry so that they could make peace. This is how Solomon started. And then when he started down that road, he continually went down that road. Now, uh, like I said, this story that we're going into is connected to so many things. I was, uh, I was saying that this probably could be like a seven part series uh, or at least more. Now, uh, this part right here, which, which talks about the Moabites and Ammonites, that connects to the story of Lot. I don't have time to go into that. Just uh, look in, uh, into, uh, uh, into Genesis chapter 19, and you will find out who Ammon and uh, Moab are. They are the uh, illegitimate sons of, uh, of Lot through his daughter, the incestuous sons of Lot through his daughter. They became nations, and that those two nations continually were an abomination uh, to Israel. So this story connects to Lot. But let's continue. It says, uh, verse, verse uh, 4, For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the, Sido the goddess of the Sidonians, and Milcom, the abomination of the Am Ammonites. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord, as did his father David. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. And he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Now, talking about worship, I mean, this man worshipped. He was worshipping here this day and there that day and there this day and there that day. Da -da 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 -da. All of these gods, this man was no stranger to worship. So if you talk about the, the amount of worship that, that, that Solomon was doing, wor worship was not lacking in the life of Solomon. But he was worshipping the wrong gods. He was not worshipping in spirit and in truth. And when you're not worshiping in spirit and in truth, especially if you have power, that power starts to oppress other people. You know, they say power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And, and, uh, and Solomon had absolute power. Solomon had uh, the, the greatest riches. He had the greatest uh, uh, intelligence. He had the, the, the greatest uh, strength of any king that had ever existed before him. And so th then that, that was something that he asked for God. And God, he asked God for wisdom. And God says, okay, sure, I'll give you wisdom. And I'll give you all these other things. Nobody's going to be like you. So he was an absolute ruler. And so that started getting to his head. And he started being uh, corrupt. So then if you get to verse 14 of uh, 1 Kings 11. So 1 Kings 11. Uh, verse 14, it says, now the Lord raised up an adversary against Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. He was the, the descendant of the king of Edom. For it happened when David was in Edom and Joab, the commander of the army, had gone to bury the slain after he had killed every male in Edom. Because for six months, Joab remained for, uh, there with Israel. 
until he had cut down every male in Edom. He had fled, Haddad had fled to Egypt. Hmm. Keep that in mind. So not just not just this one who 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 uh who fled to Egypt. So he he fled to Egypt and he was uh given um uh, he was given support there by the Pharaoh. Okay. And so you read that story, he goes there, he's in Egypt. Uh, uh, Hadad found great, verse 19. Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh so that he gave him a wife as a sister of his own wife and the sister of the queen Taphanes. And uh, the sister of the Taphanes bore him Genubath, his son. So they're telling you all of the, the, the happened there. And when Hadad heard in Egypt that David rested with his father and that Joab, the commander of the army, was dead, Hadad said to Pharaoh, let me depart that I may go to my own country. Then Pharaoh said to him, but what have you lacked with me that suddenly you seek to go to your own country? So he answered nothing, but let me go anyway. So he decided to go and he gave him an army to go with him. Uh, but that was, not the only, that was not the only rebel. There's another re rebellion, uh, verse 26. Then Solomon's servant, so the other one was a servant of David. And he got, uh, he, he got um, oppressed by the kingdom of David. And he fled to Egypt. Now we have a, a servant of Solomon, uh, Jeroboam, son of Nebat, an Ephraimite from Zereda, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow who rebelled against, also rebelled against the king. And this was the cause, this is what caused him to rebel against the king. Solomon had built the millow and repaired the dam, uh, damages of the city of David, his father. The man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor, and Solomon, seeing that the young man was industrious, made him officer over the labor force in the house of Joseph. Now it happened at the time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, met him on the way, and he had clothed himself with a new garment, and the two were alone in the field. Then Ahijah took hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it into 12 pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, take for yourself 10 pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon. I will give 10 tribes to you, but he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen out of the tribes of Israel, because they have forsaken me and worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonian, Chemosh, etc., and in verse 34, however, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand because I have made him a ruler of the days of his life for the sake of my servant, David. This is a promise fulfilling, uh, it's fulfilling a promise that God had made to Solomon because he has said uh, in verse nine, if I go back to verse nine, uh, chapter 11, verse nine. So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the God of Israel who had appeared to him twice. And I commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep the word that the Lord had commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and have not kept my commandment and my statutes, which I commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servants. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father, David. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Now. I would, I, I'm going to invite you to continue reading this part because this, this is a deep reading. The story goes that Jeroboam started to rebel, but then he was kicked out. And at the end of the chapter, you see Solomon therefore sought to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam arose and fled to Egypt to Shishak, the king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. So uh, keep this in mind. Rebellion and Egypt kind of go hand in hand. Uh, rebellion and Egypt kind of go hand in hand in the Bible. Uh, uh, even though sometimes people flee to Egypt for safety, uh, but uh, because a bad king is... is um, tormenting them and even jesus himself as a baby was uh taken to egypt uh because a bad king was tormenting and wanting to kill him but you notice that in these two cases these people who went to work with pharaoh came back with the intention to destroy the country and as a matter of fact one of them 
got to be able to have 10 tribes. Jeroboam was able to have 10 tribes because God had said so. So if you look in chapter 12, uh, the, then Solomon passes away. His son starts to rule and his son decides that he's going to be more oppressive than the father, even though the, the, the people had said, hey, you know what? Your dad, he was a little bit messed up, but we would like for, for you to become a better king. Could you please, uh, you know, ease the restrictions that you have put down? And, uh, and it's, he said, well, if you thought my dad was bad, let me show you. And, and uh, so because of that, Jeroboam came back and he rebelled and he took 10 of the tribes. The, the tribe of Benjamin decided to stay with uh, Judah. The tribe of Benjamin was supposed to, to, uh, to, to go away, but, uh, but, all, but they decided to stay with Judah. And the tribe of Benjamin at that time was a very small tribe. And for that, that's an, another interesting, very interesting story that you see right after the story of uh, Samson, uh, of how the tribe of Benjamin became, uh, came nearly to extinction. So that's, that's a different story. You find that in Judges chapter 20, I believe. Uh, 19, 19 and 20. Going back to this story, however, Jeroboam becomes king of, uh, of the northern part of Israel. The northern part of Israel retains the name Israel. There's a southern part, which is only composed of two tribes. That's the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. And that becomes the kingdom of Judah. So now these are cousins who are continually at war because Rehoboam, who's the son of Je uh, Rehoboam is the son of Solomon, is trying to fight against Jeroboam so that they can reunite, but he continually loses. So they, they eventually go like, well, you know, we can't, we can't win. So we're going to be these two separate countries. There's a Northern kingdom and there's a Southern kingdom. And in chapter 12, you start seeing now, Jeroboam start to change the worship system in the northern kingdom because he's thinking, you know, if my people who are in the north have to travel to Jerusalem, which is in the south, and they go to the pilgrimage, because, you know, remember, God had told them three times a year, three times a year, all of your men who are of age must show up in the presence of God in the place where God has dedicated himself, and that's the temple in Jerusalem. So three times a year at Passover, at, um, at, for Passover and the, the Pentecost, so that, that would be for like, uh, uh, those are too close to each other, two, two, two feasts that are close to each other, and then at uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. So those three times, every Jewish male must show up in Jerusalem. So now Jerusalem is in the south. It's in Judah. And Jeroboam, who is the king of the north, is thinking, if my people have to go to the south to worship, they may not come back. He's forgetting that God has told him, I'm going to give you the ten tribes. So he decides to set up his own system of worship in the north. And this we find in First uh, Kings chapter 12, verse 25. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the mountain of Ephraim and dwelt there. And he went out from there and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Therefore, the king asked advice, made two calves of gold, and said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods of Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. I'm like, wait a minute. Those are the same words that Aaron said when they were in the desert, when he built the golden calf. He, here is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt when they made the golden calf. So Jeroboam is thinking, hmm, let's go back to that 
same system. They create golden calf, uh, and it says he created two of them. One was placed in the southern part of the kingdom, which is called Bethel. So at the southern border, uh, uh, Bethel. And then another one was placed in the northern border of the kingdom, which is called Dan. And here's another connection to another story. So far, we've had four connections, if you have been uh, uh, counting. We've had a connection to uh, Lot. We've had a connection to... Uh, to the Levite, uh, to, to, to the, ben, uh, to, to the Benjam, Benjamites who killed the concubine of, of a Levite. And that's how Benjamin was uh, cut down as a tribe. We've had, uh, we just had a connection to, uh, to the desert when they made a golden calf. And now we had a connection to the Danites. And the Danites are also connected to Samson because Samson was a Danite. So there's five connections now. Um, The Danites were supposed to live further south. As a matter of fact, they were supposed to live uh, south of the place that we call Samaria, but they didn't conquer that place. So they were too chicken to conquer the place where they were because the place where they were had Philistines and they were afraid of Philistines. And Samson was supposed to have conquered the Philistines. And uh, because he didn't do what he was supposed to do, the Danites were like, well, these people are too much. Let's go find another place. So they traveled all the way north. And as they're traveling, they find another guy named Micah who had made an idol. And that's found in, uh, uh, in, in Judges 16 and 17, uh, who had made an idol. They're like, okay, you know what? You're going to be our guy. You're going to be our, our, uh, our independent minister. So the Danites traveled north. Not only did they leave the place where they were supposed to be, but they traveled north. And while they're traveling north, they picked up their own independent ministry. Keep in mind, we're still talking about worshiping in spirit and in truth. And when they picked up their own independent minister who had made an idol from money that he had stolen from his mother. And then he says, oh, you know, here's... Uh, Here's the money back that I stole from you. And she was like, oh, I made it. I had saved it for you so that you could uh, make this idol. So he created an idol. So the Danites go up north to the tip, 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 tip of the country up north. Uh, and they have their own independent ministry. So they decided, you know what? We don't really need to be part of this whole confederacy, we, this, this un union anymore. We could, we could have our own worship system, no problem. So the Danites eventually got completely lost. And if you look in the book of Revelation, you don't find the tribe of Dan there anymore. It's a lost tribe. They are no longer written in the book because they disappeared through a different type of worship. I brought that up because one of the golden calves was in Dan. And one of the golden calves was in Bethel. And so we get to chapter 13. First Kings chapter 13. This is another interesting, very interesting story. This is happening at Bethel. So in the south of the northern kingdom. At the border between Judah and, uh, and, and, and the Israel. So Israel is the northern kingdom. Judah is the, the southern kingdom. Keep that in mind. Verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 1. And behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Then he cried out against the altar. This is the man of God crying out against the altar. By the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord. Behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David. And on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you. And men's bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign on the same day. This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart and the ashes on it sh uh, shall be poured out. So this is a prophecy that's going to take 280 years to, to fulfill. About a, a boy named Josiah. That's, uh, that's King Josiah who becomes king at eight years old. And he learns about God. He starts studying the Bible. And he, decide, he discovers that the kingdom has 
completely got messed up. And so he decides to go and make reforms. But that's 200 ye 280 years after this happens. While this is happening, this is when Jeroboam is the king. He has created a new uh, uh, system of worship. And this, uh, this new system of worship is like, we don't need to go to Jerusalem. We don't need to... Uh, to do anything uh, up in Jerusalem, we could worship right here on this mountain, which brings us back to the story of the woman in chapter four of John, the Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman says, we worship on this mountain. You, the Jews say, you have to go to Jerusalem. So when she says that, she was making that connection between Jeroboam's religion and judah's religion how did they get to the point where they say we worship on this mountain is because they had been going through a thousand plus years of worshiping their own way and all of that started because of jeroboam and jeroboam led a successful rebellion a successful secession from the United Kingdom of the, the, the of Israel. And the reason why I brought that up today is because in our country today, we're dealing with the very similar styles of worship. We're dealing with the very similar styles and ideologies of worship to the point that it is no longer recognizable what Christianity is. And the reason why it's no longer recognizable what Christianity is, is because we have very, pretty much fallen into the same category as what Jeroboam did. Now, before I get to that, let's put, the, let's put a pin on that. Before I get to that, I want to tell you something else that happened in uh, the Northern Kingdom. Uh, so Jeroboam started this kingdom, and because he made up the golden calves, and because he uh, he decided to 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 create a new worship system. As a matter of fact, what he did, he says, "Oh, well, uh, not only am I going to put up a, a a golden calf, I'm actually going to kick out the Levites." He told the Levites, "You are fired. You don't need to to be leading worship anymore." So he fired them and sent them down south to Judah. And he says, now everybody can be a priest. Anyone that wants to be a priest can be a priest. So in, in the northern kingdom, anyone that wanted to lead worship could lead worship. There's no longer just the Levites who are chosen to lead worship. And why were the Levites chosen to, to lead worship? It's because you go back to, to, uh, to Aaron and the, and, and the golden calf when Moses came back down from the mountain and he found this uh, big celebration happening around the golden calf. He says, who's with the Lord? And only the tribe of Levi stood with Moses. And that's why they were given the, the honor, the distinction to be able to lead worship. But now Jeroboam is reversing that because he says, let's go back to golden calf worship and let's kick out the Levites. Let's reverse the whole system that happened at Sinai. And when he did that, he says, anybody in the, in the, in the land could be a priest, kicked out the Levites. And God came to him and says, well, I was going to make you a dynasty, but you're no longer going to be a dynasty. So if you get a chance, if you get a chance, please look up the succession order of the kings of the northern kingdom and the succession order of the kings of the southern kingdom in the southern kingdom it's a continuous family line as a matter of fact that family line is also given in the genealogy of jesus christ that you see in the story of matthew but the succession order of the kings in the north is a broken line it was just whoever's the strongest comes and conquers as a matter of fact there was one particular king that was in power for only seven days very interesting story because it would be this guy who comes who comes and conquer and then somebody comes and conquers him and then somebody comes comes and conquers him sometime it will get to pass it to the next to the next son uh and so uh one of those powerful ones his name was omri o-m-r-i omri conquered and he was able to reign for about 22 years and he passed the kingdom 
to his son Ahab, that same Ahab who married Jezebel. Jezebel was the daughter of a priest slash king in, in Tyre, uh, and Jezebel was was a sorcerer, uh, a sorceress. Uh, and, and so and so so you see all of these connections. The, the reason why I bring up Ahab and Jezebel is because Ahab's father, Omri, is the one who established the capital in a place called Samaria. So he established the northern kingdom's capital in a place called Samaria to a point that uh, even after Ahab moved it to Jezreel, um, the, the, the capital city continued to carry the name of the country, or I should say the, the country carried the name of the, cap, the, the capital city. So when you hear people say Samaria, they're not just talking about that city, they're talking about the entire northern kingdom. But this succession line, this broken succession line of people who were not uh, worshiping God the right way, this succession line of people who, who did not have a dynasty, um, a long family line to rule, eventually came to an end when the kingdom of Assyria came to take them over. And when when they took them over, they took them captive into Assyria. And then they took people from Philistia and other places and brought them into the northern country, the northern kingdom. So there was a mixing. This mixing of people caused confusion. And so the people of Assyria started wondering why is the land in a famine? Why are the animals attacking people? Oh, it's because they forgot how to worship the God of the land. Oh, well, if that's the case, let's bring back some of these people to teach them how to worship the God of the land. But remember, the people that they had taken from the country were not Levites. This is way before the Judah, the kingdom of Judah gets taken into captivity into uh, Babylon. We tend to talk about the Babylonian captivity, but we don't talk about the Assyrian captivity of the northern kingdom because the Assyrian captivity changed the, the, the worship system again because they brought back some of them and they say, okay, let's mix, let's mix all of the Assyrian uh, uh, methods of worship together with the, uh, with the Samaritan methods of worship and just all mixed together. It was like a conglomeration of, 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 of gods. It's just like gods everywhere. To the point that uh, it became so confusing that in order for uh, people to distinguish, they said, well, you know, we don't want to be associated or affiliated with Samaritans because Samaritans are a mixed race of, of mixed worship. That's how the Samaritans be, uh, got the, pick, picked up that, that bad reputation. So now, of course, the Jews, can't, you know, there were no ones to talk because they had their own problems, too. But they they used that. They used that mixed race, mixed worship as a way to discriminate against the Samaritans. And and so when, when you have a story, when Jesus when Jesus tells the story of a Samaritan who comes to help someone and, and, and he's telling that story to a Jewish lawyer a Jewish lawyer who respects himself. Uh, and he says, he says, at the end of the story of the Good Samaritan, he says, now, which one do you think was neighbor to the person that was hurt? And the Jewish lawyer couldn't even bring himself to speak the words, to say the word Samaritan. He says, I suppose it was the one who stopped to help. But in, in that story, Jesus was pointing out the problem at the core of these two forms of worship uh, that they have, the Jerusalem form of worship and the Samaritan form of worship. He was, he was pointing out that the Jerusalem form of worship is not necessarily the right one. And, and the Samaritan form of worship is not necessarily always evil because he was saying you could have a system of worship but look at the people themselves. So he says, a man was traveling. This man was a Jew and he got attacked by his countrymen, Jews. So he was a Jew who was attacked by Jews. Uh, to make it more palatable to us, remember, Jews believed in the Sabbath, and Jews were looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. They were Sabbath-keeping Adventists, Advent coming of, of the Lord. In other words, they were Seventh-day Adventists. So think about that in that context and say, there is a man who is a Seventh-day Adventist who is traveling from one place to another. 
He was traveling from Jerusalem. He was going to Jericho. And he met on the road some thieves who were also Jews, who were Sabbath keepers, who were looking forward to the coming of Christ. In other words, who were also Seventh-day Adventists. You have a Seventh-day Adventist who gets beat up by other Seventh-day Adventists, and they leave him for dead. And now this Seventh-day Adventist who got beat up by other Seventh-day Adventists who left him for dead, there comes a priest. A priest is coming from Jerusalem, and he says, ah, let, uh, I, don't, I don't know about this situation. I am purified. I am clean. I, am, I'm, um, uh, I cannot touch a dead body or uh, I cannot touch a bloody body. So I'm just, uh, somebody else will take care of it. That's a pastor. A Seventh-day Adventist pastor. And then comes a Levite. The Levite would be like me, an elder. Uh, so, you know, I see the situation. I look at it like, well, you know, uh, I'm on the way to work in the temple. And if I'm working to the temple, I need to be clean. I cannot get myself involved in this situation. Somebody else will take care of it. The pastor passed by the, 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 the church leader passed by and now comes the enemy the Samaritan. The Samaritan stops and gives first aid. It says that he poured wine on the wounds and he poured oil. He, he cleaned the, the, the wounds with the wine and he poured oil on them. So uh, that's alcohol. Today we use alcohol to clean wounds and we use neosporin or some kind of uh, ointment. So alcohol and ointment. First aid kit, just like we have today. And then he puts him on his own donkey. He takes him to the nearest hotel. He tells the hotel keeper, hey, I need you to take care of this person. I'm going for business, but, uh, you know, I've taken care of uh, the first aid, but uh, I need you to, to, to watch over him. Here's some money. And if you should have extra fees after that, when I come back, I will pay you. Which tells me that this Samaritan had good credit. He was known by this hotel keeper. He has a he, he he had been traveling all over the place, and uh, when I, I never looked at it this way until a, a camp meeting a few a few years back when uh, the preacher mentioned that most of the times we think we are the good Samaritan, but no, the good Samaritan is not us. The good Samaritan is Jesus, which is why the Jew was even more offended. He's like, how could the Messiah be a Samaritan? But the Messiah is the Messiah is love. And if you show love, you're living like the Messiah. If you pass by and you don't do anything, you are just like the Levite or the priest. If you beat up your neighbor, your fellow Adventist, you are just like the thieves. And most of the times, truth be told, you and I are the thieves. We're not even the Levites or the, 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 the priest. Most of the times we're so busy hurting and hitting each other that people are left for dead. And then, you know, when it, when it, would, be, it would be a good thing to look on them, we don't do it. It actually takes somebody from outside to come and do it. So how is this all related to today's climate? We're living in a country, the United States, um, which has so much division. So much division, so much anger, so much hatred. And this is a country that at this moment needs to see Christ. It needs to have a people who represent Christ. The same kind of love that Christ gave, uh, well, the the Samaritan gave to this beat beat up man. That same kind of love that would say, I'm going to pause my business. I'm going to let it inconvenience me financially. It's going to take some time because it it took time to take care of this person. It took time to take him to the hotel, which was not his hotel that he was going to stay at. It took money to make sure that he's taken care of. And it probably took more money 
to make sure that whatever extra bills have, had in, have been incurred are paid. We need the world, the country needs to see people who are willing to be inconvenienced so that somebody else could have a better life. And at this moment, it's not the case in the United States. The people who profess to be Christians are actually living out the very same words of Jeroboam. We have a confused system of worship, a confused system of worship that was born from rebellion. I mean, if you, if you look at the story of the United States of America, we rebelled. I mean, we, 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 uh, it, was, it was a rebellion against the King of England or the Kingdom of England, which was, a, which was a rightful rebellion, just like Jeroboam's rebellion started rightfully. <clears throat> and God had predicted for Jeroboam that he would have 10 of the tribes. God said it. And he said it because the king had been oppressive. So you could compare the kingdom of England to Solomon and David. So the United States of America was born as a rebellion against an oppressive system. And it was born righteously using some of the words of the Bible. However, just like Jeroboam, the United States decided to switch its methods uh, and go against the word of God. I'm going to read to you uh, something about, about an another rebellion, another rebellion that happened because, you know, you had the United States and then, you know, the United States is, is existing for a while. Uh, and then um, you had another rebellion, the rebellion of the south of the United States against the north of the United States. This time uh, it's reversed because the people that chose to leave the Union were in the south rather than the north. You know, when it, when it happened in Israel, it was the north that seceded. Uh, but when it happened in the United States, it was the south that seceded. And some of the reasons for the secession, you know, like uh, each each of the states, each of the states that decided to secede had what's called uh, a declaration of secession. These are documents that you could go find. Uh, you could their primary sources. I probably wish I hope actually you go find them, download them, save it, because I'm sure somebody's going to scrub it at some point. But uh, I'm just going to read you some words from four of the states what they said as the reason why they were seceding. Uh, let's start with Mississippi. Mississippi said, uh, our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest of the world. They're saying the institution of slavery is the best business in the world at that time. Its labor supplies the product which constitutes by far the largest and most important portions of commerce on the earth. These products, products, these people called products, have become necessities of the world and a blow at slavery is a blow at commerce and civilization. That blow has been long aimed at the institution and uh, was at the point of reaching its consummation there was no choice left us but submission to the mandates of abolition. By this abolition, they don't mean to, to removing slavery. They're talking about uh, abolition of the union uh, or a dissolution of the union. Oh, or no, I said, they said to, to submit to abolition, yes, to remove the slavery and then or dis dissolve the union, whose principles have been subverted to work out our ruin. In other words, Mississippi was saying, if we stay in the union, we're going to go broke because that means we're going to have to lose our slaves. Texas went even further. Oh, oh my goodness. They said, the servitude of the African race as existing in the States is mutually beneficial to both bond and free. You, have you heard that before where it says, oh, oh yeah, you know, black people are benefiting a lot from being owned. Um, and is abundantly authorized and justified by the experience of mankind 
and the revealed will of the Almighty Creator as recognized by all Christian nations. My, my, my. In other words, slavery is something that the Lord himself wants us to have. That's a change in religion. That's a complete change in religion. That's like Jeroboam saying, hey, you know what? Let's go back to the Egyptian style of worship. Because, you know, he fled to Egypt. And, uh, and the reason why he's going back to Egyptian style is because he fled to Egypt. But remember, Egypt is where, we, where, where, where the people of God were enslaved. I'll read further on. That was Texas. Texas is saying, not only are we, uh, is it a good business, but it's actually recognized by the creator as something good. And I, I, I don't see that in the Bible. I mean, the, those, those verses and uh, chapters that people have used to try to justify it don't really, if you look at it in the context, it doesn't work out. South Carolina said, those union states have assumed the right of deciding upon the propriety of our domestic institutions and have denied the rights of property established in 15 of the states and recognized by the constitution. They have denounced as, as sinful the institution of slavery. They have permitted open establishment among them societies whose avowed object is to disturb the peace and alloin the property of the citizens of other states. In other words, uh, the, the, they're saying the northern states are allowing um, abolitionists to, to allow, to, 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 to remove us from holding our property. Georgia said that reason was the North's fixed purpose to limit, restrain, and financially and finally abolish slavery in the states where it exists. The South, with great unanimity, declared her purpose to resist the principle of prohibition to the last extremity. So that brings me to uh, a comparison. I like to compare things. So we saw Jeroboam. Jeroboam seceded from the United Kingdom of Judah and Israel. The United States was born because of a secession from the United Kingdom of the British Empire. And the, the Confederate States of the, the, of the United States, the South, the South was result, as a result of a secession from the United States of America. By the way, I, I, I'm, if you, ref, you hear me referring to the lost cause, the lost cause religion, the lost cause myth, it, it's what, you know, the, the myth or the, the statement that when the South was seceding, it wasn't just because of slavery, it was because of states' rights, uh, uh, it was because, you know, people wanted to have freedom of determination, etc. Um, but it brings the question, what's happening today in those same states, by the way, that are saying that we need to limit the rights of people, not just to limit the rights of people, but they're using language that sounds like it's biblical. I don't mind. I don't mind if somebody has a political agenda and they carry out their political agenda. What I mind is when you use the name of the creator to support your political agenda and the political agenda is oppressing people because then you have fallen into the category of either Solomon who was oppressing his people because he's lost his way and he started worshiping all these other gods, or you're falling into the category of Jeroboam, who decided that he wanted to kill that man of God who came to tell him about, you know, the altar, etc. cetera. Uh, but either way, it's the, the state meddling into religion or the state using religion to, to, to try to explain its, uh, its, policies. And whenever you have a ruler or a leader or a political figure or, or somebody who has a power, who is using that power in combination of, with religion to try and oppress people, that is something that God cannot stand for. It is something that God is completely against. And, um, you know, and if you haven't read this, Please pick up uh, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1. When, when, I, when I read this a long time ago, I was like, wow. You know, um, uh, E.G. White, 
spent time writing about um, about the Civil War because our church was born or uh, our church, the Seventh Day Adventist Church was established in 1860 and 1861. Remember that the Civil War started in 1861. Uh, and, and then uh, so the secession had been discussed, you know, like this, this breaking away from the Union had been discussed, but finally the war started in 1861. So our church was being born at the same time as the, the, the country was falling apart. So the people of God had a particular mission to be able to, 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 to navigate this trouble in the country and to be able to, to reach people for God in a time where the country was falling apart. And at that time, the people of God, the Seventh-day Adventist church was formed by people who are actually abolitionists. Our roots go back to people who believed that uh, slavery was not godly, who believed that uh, slavery was uh, against God's will, and were also working to give rights and freedom to Black people. If you look at our church today, we have changed our position way uh, different. It's so different now that, uh, you know, I mean, I've I, I, at, at the pulpit in, in Burlington, I've talked about the story of Lucille Byer, uh, how in 1860, our church was uh, anti-slavery and was for the right of people, uh, of all people to, to have freedom and, and to have equal access. And uh, in 1943, in 1943, we were about segregation. We said, this woman cannot come to church to this hospital cannot be treated. Uh, this woman ended up dying. And because of that, uh, we have segregation in our churches now. Uh, it's like, it's like not something that we go around telling people, hey, you know, hey, we, we, we have a segregated church, but we really kind of have segregated churches. Uh, it's not by, by church policy, it's just how we exist. And, and it's because we have never fully repented of the sin of supporting that institution of slavery. And so reading in the, in the spirit of prophecy, in, in uh, Testimonies for the Church, volume one, chapter 55, which is on pages 264 to 268, uh, she says, Pharaoh had so long withstood God and hardened his heart against his mighty wondrous works that he in blindness rushed into the path which God had miraculously, miraculously prepared for his people. Again, Moses was commanded to stretch forth his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its strength. And the Egyptian waters, and the waters covered the Egyptian host and they were drowned. This scene was presented to me to illustrate the selfish love of slavery and the desperate measures which the South would adopt to cherish the institution and the dreadful lengths to which they, they would go before they would yield. The system of slavery has reduced and degraded human beings to the level of the brutes and the majority of the slave masters regard them as such. The consciences of the masters have, have become seared and hardened as was pharaohs. I'm going to pause there. So there's a comparison that's happening between um, slaveholding southern states to pharaoh. In other words, that's an Egyptian form of worship. And this Egyptian form of worship is very similar to what eventually uh, led to people having the golden calf, led to people, uh, to, to pharaoh uh, um, trying to kill the, 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 the people of God, and also led to uh, Jeroboam eventually losing his way, and also Solomon losing his way. So basically, you could always trace that back to the, to the Pharaoh's heart. And she continues to say, if compelled to release their slaves, their principles remain unchanged, and they would make the slave feel their oppressive power if possible. She was right. This is written in... Um, 
1862. But later when uh, the Civil War is won and there's the, the, the time of reconstruction and then uh, the Southern states eventually force the North to remove the, the soldiers and then reconstruction ends and then Jim Crow begins. The same people continually wanted to make black people feel inferior and to destroy them at, at all if possible. And it says, God alone can wrench the slave from the hand of the desperate, relentless oppressor. All abuse and cruelty exercised toward the slave is justly chargeable to the upholders of the slave system, whether they be Southern or Northern men. In the same chapters, in the same chapters, uh, so the same chapter, chapter 50, uh, 55, and even for chapter 54, she mentions how the South was completely against God. In other words, the South is not going to win this war because they're completely against God. And the North is not going to win the war until they make the war about slavery. Because at first, the war was about just reunification. But then eventually, they're like, no, 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 you need to make this war about slavery. And why do I bring all of this up? In recent years, a recent decade, there's, be, there's been this, uh, it, it actually started, it's, it's, you, know, you know, the devil is very clever. It started with something that sounded like it's a good thing. And it is a good thing, the preservation of life. So uh, somebody, you know, like uh, uh, the abortion, the anti-abortion movement was not actually a mainstream thing until uh, Richard Nixon picked it up and made it a big thing. And Richard Nixon picked it up and made it a big thing. That together with something else called law and order. Those two concepts they, 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 they grabbed them and they made them this political platform to unify conservatives under um, a Christian banner. Now, conservatives, of course, had usually been uh, Christian or Christians, I should say, would have been conservatives. Uh, but, but some people have been tricked into thinking that conservatism equals Bible righteousness. And that's not true because Bible righteousness says that God is love. And if you use the platform of law and order or the platform of anti-abortion to oppress other people, then you have lost your footing in being able to spread the gospel. It's so convoluted and so confused that to this point now, it kind of goes back to the same conversation that Jesus had with a Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman says, you Jews say that we have to go to Jerusalem to worship. We have been worshiping on this mountain. So which one is right? In other words, today you could say, you conservatives say we have to do this and that and the other. But we, the liberals, have been doing this and that and the other. Which one is right? And Jesus says, neither. Neither liberalism or conservatism is right. He says, the day is coming when true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth because God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Last year, I can almost guarantee that the majority of the people that stormed the Capitol believed themselves to be Christian. Like, I have no doubt that these people believe that they are Christian. And, and, and Christianity in the United States of America has lost its way. 
And the fact that we can sit in judgment of others, the fact that we can try to justify our actions using the Bible while oppressing others. And as I mentioned before in, a, in, in my last sermon, the fact that we could go and protest that someone who killed somebody else because they hated him, we could go protest that that person should be set free and we say that we're Christian. That makes no sense. We have lost our way. We need to go back to what Jesus is telling to the Samaritan woman. We need to go back to the spirit and truth. We need to go back and find out what is Jesus saying through the story of the good Samaritan? What is he telling us about those thieves? What is he telling us that we have missed? What, how all of this connects throughout history and study these things. And like I said, this is, this is way too long for one, one sitting. As a matter of fact, I appreciate your time. But I'm asking you, with all of the things that we have looked at today, go back through those stories. Go through the story of Samson, the story of Jeroboam, the story of Aaron, the story of Lot, the story of uh, uh, Solomon. Go through uh, what happened to the man of God. Go through uh, wh what happened when, when the Assyrians repopulated them. Go through what happened when they come back from the captivity. Trace all of this as it leads them to where Jesus is sitting with this woman at the well. This woman who has been oppressed by her own people. And how Jesus gives her freedom that she can never have imagined. And the freedom comes from crossing the barriers of all the conflicts. And we can finally see what Jesus is trying to do. When he says, God is spirit, worship him in spirit and in truth. God bless you. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Elder John, for that powerful, powerful message. We are so grateful. And we agree that it is something that we will have to study in depth. And perhaps we will need to invite you back for the other six parts of that seven part series that you referred to earlier. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. We are going to go over to Sister Daphne for our closing song, after which we will have Elder John deliver the benediction. Over to you, Sister Daphne. Amen. Our closing song is 229. All held the power of Jesus' name. Oh, held the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord. Ye chosen seeds of Israel race, ye ransom from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. 
To him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with wonder angels strong we at his feet may fall. We're joined the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We're joined the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Father God, thank you so much for your blessing. Lord, we crown you Lord of all. We ask you, Lord, that you would change our hearts, change our minds to learn how to worship you right, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth, to know you because to know you is life. And Lord, that same life that you have given us and redeemed us for i pray that you will give this life to each one who's listening who's watching who is who will be watching again later and uh our families and our friends bless every one of us bless our spheres of influence bless each one with that life lord not just here but eternally in jesus christ's name amen Amen. Thank you, Elder John, for the powerful message. Thank you, Elder Beckett, for leading out today and everyone who took part in the service. Please, if you have not had a moment, take this time to go onto our website and uh, return to your tithe and offering as the Lord commands us to do. Until we meet again, everyone have a blessed Sabbath. May God richly bless you and keep you. Good afternoon.